<laughs> Gun rhymes with fun for a reason, stranger. <laughs> The Resident Evil 4 Remake is the best of the RE Engine era of the Resident Evil titles. It took many lessons learned from the prior two remakes to heart to deliver an excellent remake. It's not better than the original, and I wasn't expecting it to be, but turned out about as well as I could imagine in this day and age. There are a number of tweaks and adjustments to keep things fresh and keep you guessing. While there are some disappointing cuts and the story loses a fair amount of the charm compared to the original, it's a remake that Capcom should be proud of. One in which I'm hoping is the end of Resident Evil Remakes, now focusing on the future, although the ending seems to indicate otherwise. Then come, Sancho Panza. Let us rescue the Princess Dulcinea. You gotta hurt yourself. Hey, that was my dance. For the remake, I played on hardcore difficulty. Leading up to release, I replayed the original to gather footage and keep it fresh in mind. It was the first time I tried out the Resident Evil 4 HD project. What a fan mod. It's obvious how much of a labor of love this project was, starting on the way back in 2014. Feels like how I thought the game looked back in 2005. Very much a case of Capcom, hire this man. Now, Capcom didn't hire him, but as of writing the script, Night Dive Studios did. If you ever replay the original on PC moving forward, do use it. Here is the spoiler warning. There are now full spoilers on both RE4's throat, along with some lighter spoilers of other games in the series. I'll let myself out. The more grim tone of the remake is set right off the bat. Sure, the original could be dark and grim, but there was plenty of B-movie and action cheese throughout. It was part of its charm. There is a lot of charm throughout the remake, although at varying levels, and never hits the charm of the original, nor was I expecting it to. Leon is more dark and moody in the intro, remembering the events of Raccoon City. He's less of a wisecracker than he was in the original. That said, he still maintains plenty of that attitude, if more low-key this time around. I'm sure you boys didn't come all the way out here to roast marshmallows. <laughs> Maybe you did. There are some shifts to our first encounter. Instead of both cops waiting behind in the car, the one who takes a leak doesn't return. This takes us to the Hunter's Lodge for our first encounter with the Ganado. I didn't like this encounter as much as the original. The fact that's all in the cutscene takes away from the moment. Plus, I always loved in the original that long spin the first Ganado did. I was wondering if he might recognize a girl in this photograph. We have a talk with Hunnigan, whom Leon knows prior to the mission this time around, which makes more sense. I always found that a bit odd in the original. This was Leon and Hunnigan's first time talking with one another. I'm Ingrid Hunnigan. I'll be your support on this mission. Loud and clear. Somehow I thought you'd be a little older. While Hunnigan wasn't around very long in the original, she feels even less of a presence here. Which is too bad, because I enjoyed the chats with their codenames. Ashley's codename being Baby Eagle is adorable. Gundar one to roost. The church is sealed up. And Baby Eagle? As of writing, there are no Baby Eagle Ashley mods. I hope someone gets on that. Prior to the village fight, we run across a few Ganados to get a feel for combat and all its changes. So let's talk combat. There's been a number of changes to the combat in the remake. Some elements of combat pulled from the prior two remakes. It's a slower pace than the original. It doesn't go for that arcade feel. It's less tight and a bit more sloppy, both in a good and bad way. One of the major changes is how the knife works. The knife now has durability. It can be upgraded. We can increase its damage, its durability, and repair it for a cost. We can pick up other knives like a kitchen knife. They have lower durability and damage, but they can help us out in a pinch when our main knife is broken. We could use the knife to parry, time it right to deflect attacks and open up a melee window. I have to note how great melee attacks feel here. While it's less of a crowd controller this time around, it packs a lot of weight. You can feel those bones being crushed with the excellent sound design. Out of the way. A knife adds a layer of decision making when we're grabbed by an enemy. Either shake them off for a period of time for higher damage, or use the knife right away but take a heavy penalty to its durability. It's a great split second decision to take in regards to how your combat encounter is going. Downing enemies open up opportunities for an instant kill with a knife. Handy in cases where we can prevent the enemy from leashing their plagas. <laughs> Stealth is now an option. Using crouch can also be used to avoid enemy attacks beyond backstabs. It's a nice option to clear some enemies before being spotted to save ammo. Thank goodness the game never goes down the route of four stealth sections. It's always an option, but you never have to outright use it. Another change is how Leon moves. In the original, he'd turn and stop on a dime. Here it's along the lines of the prior two remakes. He doesn't stop right away. He's a bit more difficult to control. Did I find this to be a major issue? After getting used to it, 
Not really. These factors lead to a different flow and pace to combat compared to the original. While it's still frantic, it's a more methodical pace. And for what the game is going for, it works quite well. Now, there are elements of combat where I am more mixed on, the main element being the inconsistency of staggers in regards to head and knee shots. In the original, these were always consistent. You knew with certain enemy types that a head or knee shot would always stagger and you could plan accordingly in the moment. This could help with crowd control. There was no ambiguity. That's not the case here. Sometimes shot will stagger, sometimes they don't. I'd be surprised at points when a shot would kill an enemy when I thought it would take a bit more. This inconsistency was present in the prior two remakes, and for that slower pace and what they were going for, it worked. Here, I'm not sure it was the right choice. This led to a few cases of taking damage where I didn't think I should have. Holding down while aiming for a few moments will increase the accuracy and chance of a critical hit. This is something that carried over from the prior two remakes. It increases the chances of a stagger, but there's still ambiguity about it. Now, I have seen mods that address this, where a head or knee shot will always result in a stagger. However, the game was bounced around this element of ambiguity, so it doesn't 100% address the problem. Is it a deal breaker or huge detriment? No. It's a different design decision to fit with the more current RE titles. It's an excellent combat system, but it doesn't feel as tight as the original. Although to be fair, despite all the games that copied the RE4 formula, few were able to come close to how tight combat was. Ammo management has changed with the addition of a crafting system. However, unlike Resident Evil Village, these crafting items take up slots in our inventory. In Village, it was easy to just sit on crafting items until you needed them. You can still do that here, but to a lesser extent. They take up a fair amount of real estate. A decision I feel was the right choice. All these shifts to the combat system lead to a bit of a learning curve having just come from the original. Ammo's far more sparse and the knife saw far greater usage. In regards to weapons, all your favorites return, with a few new additions. One notable change being the bolt thrower, an interesting weapon with two distinct options. First being the reusable bolts, whether from a downed enemy or if you missed and hit a wall or ground. The second option is far more interesting, the option to attach a mine and use it as a mine thrower. I ended up making heavy use of this gun all the way up until the island. When I replayed the original prior to the remake, I made heavy use of the mine thrower, a weapon I've tended to ignore over the years. It was a nice change of pace. It's very much a high risk reward weapon. Get your timing right and it's an incredible crowd clearer. However, the mine has a long countdown. If your timing is off, you might be on the receiving end of damage from your own mine. The mine thrower is far more forgiving here in the remake. You could use it as a proxy mine on floor and walls. If you hit an enemy with a mine, the countdown is far shorter compared to the original. Of course, you still have to be careful with your timing. With that, back to the village fight. It's very much that wake up call like it was in the original, especially if you make use of old habits from the original. A nice addition is that you could shoot the church bell in the distance to end the encounter. Now, if you wish this encounter could go on forever, it can, thanks to the power of modding. That mod being church bell no more. This was a nice place to toy around with various mods, such as changing character models. I'm sure we were all on the edge of our seats wondering if the bingo line made the cut. Thank goodness it did. It's unfortunate that a number of classic lines from the original didn't. Where's everyone going? Bingo? You know who is going to bingo? Hunnigan. There's a sticker for it on her monitor. There's some notable music happening during the village fight. It has some interesting instrumentation and industrial feel. Unfortunately, this was the exception and not the norm of the remake. I was let down by the music. There are great tracks here, but a number of them ended up blending into the background. To be fair, unmemorable music is an issue that a majority of modern games struggle with. One thing that I feel the original RE4 doesn't get enough credit for is its soundtrack, and just how weird it can be. Abstract soundscapes feel appropriate for a number of tracks. Something that feels better suited for Silent Hill. I wonder how many were carryovers from a prior iteration of Resident Evil 4 when it had a heavy psychological horror approach. In the original, the music did heavy lifting in regards to building out that eerie atmosphere. Again, the tracks aren't bad here, but I found most of them unmemorable. There were exceptions like the village fight and the merchant's track. With that, let's talk about the character changes in the remake, starting with our good friend, the merchant. Ooh, 
You have the stench of battle on you, mate. <laughs> Watching footage prior to release, I wasn't sold on the new voices, but I did come around to most of them, the merchant being one of the highlights. There was a great integration of old and new lines. That cash in your pocket or your life. Easy choice, mate. Although I wish he wouldn't talk as much while I was browsing his wares. I like the addition of his reactions to buying weapons. Ah, that there's a real boomstick, mate. It will reduce your target to a bloody it did take a while to hear I'll buy it at a high price. He saves that for far more pricey items. Ah, I'll buy it at a high price. Which leads to another welcome addition to the remake, that being the revamped treasure and gemstone system. Depending on what gemstone we insert into treasures, we can obtain a different multiplier to the selling price. Like having gemstones of the same color or number of different colors will change the multiplier accordingly. It's a small yet great addition that adds to the decision making factor. Do I use the current gemstones I have now to place into a treasure for selling? Or do I wait a bit longer to find some higher quality gemstones to get a greater return? You don't have to commit right away. You have the option of removing gemstones before selling. The shooting gallery received a nice makeover where the game allows a lot of the cheese and charm to shine. Something I wish that was more prominent in the main game. Using old music tracks from the original, especially when the bonus round kicks in, was a great touch. A nice balance of fan service without feeling like it was over the top. The Merchant had a nice adaptation to the remake, but how about some of the other key characters we come across in the village? What about Leon? I enjoyed his character in the Resident Evil 2 remake. Leading up to this remake, I was a bit uncertain of how they do here. I was thinking they were going to overdo the dark tone and lose a lot of that charm from the original. And while some of that is lost, I was overall happy with how his character turned out. More serious? Sure. But he's not afraid to drop some wise cracks here and there. Some old, some new. Nighty night. Nights. Keep your dogs on a leash, people! Talk about sticking the landing. He will talk during combat, but short blurbs here and there. Not a case that plagues modern games where characters don't know when to shut up. Some blurbs are handy for gameplay purposes, like mentioning we just used our last healing item. None left. Leon's fine, so what about Baby Eagle? What about Ashley Graham? Another case of going in, I wasn't 100% sold upon seeing footage, but they did a great job with Ashley, both narrative and on a gameplay front. In the original, I always felt that she got more hate than she deserved. In regards to escort missions, you could do so much worse. Unless you did a major goof, she did a good job of staying out of the way. You could just get her to hide or wait a fair distance back. As well, there were good stretches of the game that she wasn't with us. All that carries over here. They did even more to make her less of a hindrance. Instead of using up a healing item, we only need to approach her when she's incapacitated to help her back up. Thanks. Anytime. Instead of wait or follow me, it's stay close or keep a distance. I'm not sure why they took out wait at first, although I never found it a huge issue. There are still hiding spots, although those were fewer in number. Unless you're really dropping the ball, keeping yourself alive is going to be your main concern. She receives some shifts to her personality. She's less of a brat this time around. At first, she is more timid and scared, no doubt due to the trauma that she's been through. But overall, she does open up and gains more confidence and trusts Leon more. It's well done with how it's paced out. They found the right balance of adding some talks between them in their travels along with in-combat scenarios, but not overdoing it. And while she is less of a brat this time around, that does come at a bit of a cost. In the original, that bratty attitude made her feel like she really was the daughter of the President of the United States. Someone who would use the, do you know who my father is card whenever she could. Here, I didn't get that same vibe that she was a very important person due to the attitude shift. It's dialed back. Now, there are moments where it does come to the surface, but those were the exception and not the norm. Like when I told her to hide in the locker. Wait here. What? Uh, okay. Having her cheer us on during the shooting gallery was an excellent idea. It's moments like this where the charm of the remake shines through. That was awesome. 
I had a great deal of curiosity around Luis going into the remake. Seeing the footage prior to release was a reason. He's still live during the minecart section? How much more screen time is he going to get? How much longer is he going to be involved in the story? His personality has seen a bit of a shift. At first, he has more of that slimy car salesman vibe around him. As the game goes on, we're able to gain a better understanding of his motivations and his intentions. They go more into his backstory here, clarifying his prior work with Umbrella as a researcher. An issue I did have with his character here was the constant mention of smokes. How observant, senor. Now, uh, say, uh, you got a smoke? I know those things will kill you. It was nice to bring it up while meeting him, but it was just a memorable line from the original. It wasn't a huge part of his personality. Not a huge detriment, and it didn't get into a flanderization of his character, but it felt a bit forced. Otherwise, for the tone that they're going for, Luis works well. I did like how the game throws us off in his intro, going into the house thinking that's him making the noise in the cabinet like the original, only to discover it's a Ganado making that noise. What about Mendez? What about the big cheese? This is where the remake drops the ball. Not just Mendez, but all the villains. I had a hard time putting my finger on why I didn't care for Mendez as much here. The other villains, that was much easier. His look is fine. His voice is fine. He doesn't get any less screen time than the original. He just lacks that presence of the original. I didn't mind the hat addition, although I did mind another villain getting their hat taken away. Although, more on that later. At least this time when meeting, Leon doesn't run up to him throwing a kick. Did he really think that would work on the big cheese? The big cheese. What? With that, let's go through some notable elements around the village portion. I did appreciate that not everything is a one-to-one -one replica of what came prior. If I wanted that, I'd just go play the original. Some layouts have changed, and without loading screens, there were a few cases of, oh, that's how these areas are connected together. So here, the village is a bit more interconnected. Not to the extent of classic RE, but it's noticeable. There's plenty of small additions, like chests to revisit once you have a key. They're never out of your way in regards to revisit, which is appreciated. Same goes for side quests that we could get from the merchant. There's nothing groundbreaking about them, they don't really do anything to flesh out the world, but they're along the way, so it's not like you have to go out of your way to do them. The original wasn't loaded with puzzles. While there are more puzzles in the remake, it's not like they upped them by a great number. Most are simple, quick affairs. Palette cleansers. Well, most of them. Some of the optional ones, like the ones on the islands with turning the circuits, drove me up the wall. An element that's received plain discussion is the excessive use of yellow to guide the player. Yellow paint all over breakables and to guide the player to the point of hilarity. Yes, there are mods to remove it. And this is a problem that the RE engine titles have suffered from. Visual clarity. Although, to be fair, this is something modern games have struggled with for well over a decade now. It'd be common for me to clear out a room, check the map, and realize I'd missed an item or two. It's overkill with the yellow paint. Thing is, the game does well in other areas of guiding the player. One example being through audio cues, the creaking of lamps hiding treasures. <clears throat> There were points where the game made use of flickering lights or the sounds to guide the player forward, but too often they went to the well of smear yellow paint all over the place to the point of parody. Yes, I know it's a game and there's suspension of disbelief, but they crossed that yellow painted line. Back to the village, I like the progression from day to night, along with these smaller medium sized tweaks along the way to keep you guessing, like facing the dogs in the village fight area upon revisiting with the collapsing tower. That's an interesting element in regards to remakes if you played the original. The anticipation of what's coming next and how they're going to throw some curveballs to keep you guessing. So when I got to the lake where the Del Lago fight is, of course the first thing I did was shoot the lake from the dock. Well, that was disappointing to say the least. It felt like they realized late in development they forgot to put it in and did so quickly. Not a lot of care was given to it. The fight itself is whatever. I've never been a huge fan of this fight. Very spongy on hardcore. The El Gigante fight is much better. At the beginning of the game, we saw a dead dog. However, the one that helped us here shows up later, next to the house where we run into Mendez. On the note of this house, it was nice to see Toilet Man back. I always found it odd in the original how it was a urinal. So our canine companion makes a majestic return for this fight. And boy, did they give him an entrance. Hey, it's that dog. 
Earlier on, I was wondering what this house was that was gated off after the farm area. And then when I saw Lewis waving us in later, I was like, oh, of course, what else would it have been? It's the cabin fight. I'm sure like many others, the first thing I did when this fight started was to fill Lewis with lead to see if there was a special game over. <laughs> Adios, Leon. But there wasn't much to my disappointment. I know you had to go out of your way in the original to get it, but it was a nice little touch. Very much a case of, hey, what if the player did try to shoot him here? Hey, are you trying to kill me? While I found most of the cutscenes in the remake fine, if I'm memorable, there were a few exceptions. Like the one with the first appearance of the two Chainsaw Sisters. Instead of backing away, Leon does this goofy ass flip, and I'm all for it. <laughs> One major bummer was the removal of the gondola section. I miss watching Ashley give her little fist pumps each time we took someone down. She still does this in the remake, although with the camera placement and her keeping a distance, it's harder to see on the regular. Holy. All right. The chase scene with Mendez was a disappointment. One curious thought I had with Mendez was if they were going to make him more of a pursuer throughout the village. I'm glad they didn't go that way. That would require some major changes that I didn't think would fit for what the game is going for. But this part felt like they wanted to include something along those lines, and it's very much a meh encounter overall. The fight with him is fine. I did enjoy the dodges Leon does with the context prompts. And it was nice to hear elements of the original song used here. One common issue throughout the remake with bosses was the lack of seeing the boss transformations. Something that add to that shit just got real factor gets stripped away. I thank you for your gift. So overall, with the village, they did a great job here keeping faithful while making some changes to keep you on your feet. Give my regards to your god. A most warm welcome to my castle. Such a pleasure to finally make your acquaintance, Mr. Kennedy. I'm more mixed on the castle. There are some nice new additions, but there are some disappointing changes and removals that I was hoping to stay in. But hey, that's how it is with remakes. At least they learned their lesson from the prior two remakes and didn't cut huge stretches. Like nearly every other character, seeing Salzar prior to release, I was skeptical, but his appearance and voice won me over. Although I don't know why they gave Mendez a hat and took Salzar's away. There is a mod to give him his hat back. An unnecessary mod in the sense that he should have had it in the first place. But the most disappointing thing with Salazar is the lack of back and forth between Leon and himself. In the original, some of the most memorable lines occurred in these back and forths. So maybe you have nine lives, but it doesn't matter now, Mr. Kennedy. I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? Hmm. Say whatever you please. Die, you worm! <laughs> Throughout the castle, he'll talk to us on a one-way intercom, depriving us of those back and forths. And while he is very chatty during the fight with him, you also have to concentrate on the fight itself as there is a lot going on. Some of these lines turn to background noise as a result. This is a major downgrade of the remake across the board with its villains. While there are some good exchanges in these fights, they're hard to focus on compared to having a simple dialogue exchange like the original. In regards to the guard doors, the blind ones, I found the build-up to the first one was very well done, with the hanging chains from the roof to consider noise-wise leading to great tension. Considering all he's gone through, his oral hygiene seems to be just fine. I was looking forward to seeing how the water room would turn out. Some had the audacity to say they hoped Capcom would cut this room. Thankfully, Capcom didn't listen to these scrubs and kept it in. Back in the day when I first played the original, I barely made it through the water room the first time. Short on ammo, short on life. It's one of those moments where I remember thinking, this is one of the best games I've ever played. So the very idea of cutting such a memorable room is ludicrous. 
It's very much a wake-up call if you're not prepared. Here, they did make some compromises to ease the difficulty and fit better with the remake's pacing. It's still well-designed and great memorable experience, although it does fall short of the original. It's changed here to be split into three parts, whereas the original had two halves. The lower level has been changed to make it more of a self-contained section. With the different pace of combat, I can understand the change, but it felt like they could have been a little less merciful on the player here. As well, what made the original room so great was stepping in from the loading screen and being welcomed by a great horde of enemies waiting for us. Which doesn't happen here, you have to go further in for them to emerge. Coming into the castle, I was curious to see how much time Ashley would spend with us and sections where she wasn't, along with how we would be separated from her. In the original, Ashley gets separated with one of the most convoluted traps that I'm sure Salazar was thinking. I can't believe that actually worked. You all right? I'm fine! Just leave me alone! Ashley, wait! <laughs> I'm coming for you! Here, it's due to Las Plagas taking a toll on her. This is a welcome story change to the remake, how much the parasite is impacting them. It comes up more often and there's more weight to it. Foolish little lamb. Temperance, child. Ashley. Which leads to one of the better cutscenes of the remake once we reunite. A simple scene between Ashley and Leon about not giving up. I don't know if I can. You can. Just give me a heads up before you stab me next time, okay? <laughs> Leon, I'm... Thanks. She begins to open up more to Leon, and there's some fun flirting scenes. So... You do a lot of missions like this? Well, yeah, but I'm not used to having such good company. Is that a compliment? <laughs> Take it however you want. Hey, Leon, there's some armor. Bet you could use it like a bulletproof vest. <laughs> Little old-fashioned for my taste. Mm, too bad. I think you'd look pretty dashing. <sighs> my hero. The section where we play as Ashley gets a big change. We still deal with the knights, but this stretch vastly differs in its layout and pacing. There's also some pretty funny lines here from her during this stretch. Oh, thank God. I am done with armor. Didn't I just say I was done? While separated from Ashley, Leon has a reunion with Ada Wong. When Ada was first revealed in the trailer, a lot was made of her vocal performance. You can stop right there, Leon. While the other characters did win me over, Ada did not. Besides Leon, she's the only returning character. Unlike Leon, she has a different voice actor from the one in Resident Evil 2 Remake. From what I understand, the actress there is now a union actor, and Capcom stays away from union actors. I really hoped it wouldn't end up like this. So that's all this was. I was just some pawn to you. Look, I'm just doing my job. And I'm doing mine, so drop that damn gun. I'm taking you in. Hand over the sample, Leon. So who are you working for this time? Oh, Leon. You know I don't work in town. Instead, they got the actress who played Ada in the Return to Raccoon City movie. A strange choice, but I guess there is some consistency on that front. But here, Ada falls flat. Case of bad vocal direction and a miscast. Instead of that stoic femme fatale, most lines come across as her sounding bored. And there's inconsistency. Some lines are fine performance-wise, while others aren't. It's unfortunate that her actress has been on the receiving end of bullying on social media. She was hired for a job she wasn't a fit for. That fault lies further up the food chain. On a positive note, she looks fantastic. And good lord, those boots. Ah, damn it. Looking for something? 
The castle has a number of deviations from the original, some additions, some removals, and some areas merged. A bit hit and miss overall. One addition I love were the elite cultists in red with a staff that could pull the Plagas out of other cultists. A great little gameplay addition. Gloria las Plagas! Gloria las Plagas! The room with the first encounter with them was a tight space in a very tense scenario, one of the best additions to the game. Whenever they showed up, you know shit got real. The further into the castle I got, the more it was apparent how efficient it was to make Resident Evil Village around the same time. The castle and village in that game made it easy for asset reuse, or tweaking assets instead of starting from scratch. Very much a case of working smart. Like the village, the castle is a bit more interconnected compared to the original. Although without loading screens, the castle doesn't feel as grand as it did. Another addition I enjoyed was the section with the armored El Gigante. Less the invasion of his throws, but the earlier section of opening and closing gates with the sun and moon doors to progress forward. Another change is to the Novista doors. I prefer the initial reveal of them in the basement in the original, a much more spooky environment. That said, their music track here was one of the better ones in the game, and it was very satisfying to kick them. There were a couple of sections of the castle that were removed, much to my disappointment. One's more on the silly side of things, so I was curious to see what they would do with them. In that case, it was removing them altogether. And the ones of note were the Dragon Treasure Room and the Salazar Statue Run. Such over-the-top stretches full of cheese, yet very memorable. Now, they do clash with the darker tone present in the remake, but these were such memorable parts. To have them cut instead of a reinterpretation was disappointing. This also gets into something I haven't discussed yet, the removal of QTEs. While they were done prior to the original RE4, they did contribute to resurgence and over-reliance of QTEs for a number of years afterwards. Although as a result of these QTE removals, there are some great death scenes that were removed. <laughs> I wish there was a way to keep these in gameplay-wise, because there are some decent death scenes during combat, but I did really miss these special, unique ones. I was glad to see them keep the sit on the throne scene, although it's been moved to the palace room here in the castle instead of the island, which is fine by me, more fitting for the setting. The Verdugo fight in the basement is still here in an excellent, tense affair. Although there are some combat issues that arise during this fight that pop up throughout the game. That being another case of ambiguity. This issue of ambiguity between knife parries and context prompts evasions. For some incoming attacks, I was expecting a context prompt, but instead we'll get a knife parry prompt, or the other way around. The Mendes fight did a great job of making these attack lineups clear of what to expect. But there were a few cases during this fight or fights with cultists where I was ready for parry, but I got the context prompt to dodge. Not a huge issue, but something to note. As I mentioned earlier, I was curious to see the role of Lewis in the remake when the trailers revealed he'd be with us during the minecart section. With the original, I felt he was killed off too early in the story when his character still had some legs. As well, Ashley didn't react to his death when we walked by his corpse and isn't brought up afterwards. Both of these points are addressed, the second point with better execution. Beyond the cabin fight, we get a stretch near the end of the castle where he joins us, so they took some time to develop some combat partner AI. Hmm, it's as if there's a title they're thinking of remaking that contains a co-op partner with AI. Anyways, the minecart section has been turned into a glorified turret section. We have to reload, although we have unlimited ammo. There's no jumping back and forth between carts as we try to keep enemies out like in the original. Instead, it's keeping the cart alive by keeping enemies at bay. Not bad by any stretch, but I prefer the original hopping back and forth between a few carts. Then we get to the death of Luis. This time, it's not Sadler, someone who's barely been a presence in the remake. Instead of coming to the church when we rescued Ash in the original, he sends something akin to a telepathic signal. Instead, he sends in Krauser to do the deed. Deliver to these vagrant children their salvation. As you wish. This change has consequences. This raises the stakes against Krauser, but takes away some from Sadler. And in the end, that does feel like a waste. Krauser does have a past with Leon, something that gets expanded upon in the Dark Side Chronicles, an excellent spin-off that I recommend checking out. And Krauser brings up the events here of Operation Javier a lot, as in more or less it becomes his personality, although we'll touch more upon that in the island section. Without the QTEs, we do have a knife fight with him through gameplay, no guns allowed. Fight works well here with using parries and context prompts to evade certain attacks. 
Attacks that are clear in telegraphing whether expect a parry or an evasion prompt. It's funny that a tutorial popped up on how to use the knife again in case he didn't use it much up to this point. In Krauser's voice, it's more unhinged and more fitting with his characterization here. Catch on quick. Didn't I teach you? Knives are faster. However, it's his character changes that I found to be one of the more notable downgrades compared to the original. But let's wait until the island to discuss that. Luis gets a nice send off, and when they meet again, Leon brings up the fact to Ashley that he's now dead. While dead, he does have a greater presence throughout the rest of the game, which is a good choice story wise, and giving him a final smoke was fitting. I was glad to see his character have more of a role this time around. You know, I led a pretty shitty life. But now, hey, <clears throat> what do you think, Leon? People can change, right? The Salazar fight, while enjoyable, does a couple of things that are notable issues with the remake, both I've covered earlier. There is some great banter here from Salazar talking about a play on Leon's role in it. Of course, you also have to be paying attention to the fight itself. Because he's saying so much, it's difficult to focus on one without disregarding the other. There could be a lot here spread throughout the castle if he jacked the line like he did in the original. Have a mix of what he said here along with some classic lines. Like Mendez, the game deprives us of seeing the transformation into his monster form. Without that buildup, the fight loses some of that luster. Instead, he just goes off screen comes back as this new monster, as opposed to have transformed in the original which we got to witness. That said, I did like the changes to his fight. It's far more tense than the fight in the original. Don't think too hard, handsome. See you later. The story of my life. And with that, we move on to the island. Ah, uh, the island. The controversial section of the original. The worst part of the original. Something I agree with, but I never found the drop in quality to be too large. I always felt it a bit over-exaggerated. Before it was revealed, there was speculation that a lot of cuts would be made to the island. Hell, some thought they would be cut altogether. However, Capcom has learned their lessons of excessive cuts. See Resident Evil 3 Remake. There are cuts here and there, but the major beats remain the same, but ones I miss less than the cuts made to the castle. Some sections are merged that do tighten up the pacing, especially near the end. Although right off the bat, I think their red laser guns should have remained on the cutting room floor. They receive little usage and pad out the sections they're in. And why did they replace the Gatling Man? I was looking forward to seeing how he turned out here. To have him replaced was disappointing. Oven Man returns, although it shifted around. I had a hunch of where he was going to appear, and lo and behold, there he was. The section I was looking forward to the most, of course, were the regenerators. And it didn't disappoint. They didn't miss with perfection here in regards to design and sound. And here, they're thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. You pervert! I love the changes to the environment, the use of powering up sections, and finding the scope. The major beats are all here, but enough tweaks to keep you on your toes and guessing. Like I said earlier, it's one of those experiences you could only get with a remake having played the original. What's it going to be like this time? Some areas were merged, like Ashley taking control of the crane with the wrecking ball is a nice combo of the truck driving sequence and the room with the wrecking ball from the original, although it goes on a bit too long. Plus, she now gives insight into how she knows how to control this kind of machinery. Is this what they teach kids in school these days? Have you never heard of driver's ed? And then finally, FINALLY, we have some face-to-face -face time with Sadler. While well, I mentioned earlier most of the cutscenes were passable but nothing noteworthy, this one is an exception. Ashley doing all that she can to fight off being controlled by Sadler as she's pointing the gun at Leon? This is a fantastic bit of tension and execution. Stop! <laughs> Sweet child, do not resist. <laughs> I 
Again, like the other villains, Sadler is a downgrade from the original. Like Salazar, he doesn't talk to us throughout the island. You know, they had an easy way to do this without hijacking the line. He contacts us telepathically back at the church. Why couldn't he throw some jabs at Leon at various points during the island this way? Like with Salazar in the original, some of the game's more memorable lines came from the talks he had with Leon over a radio. Ah, I have an idea. Since you're here, why don't I introduce you to it? It should keep you busy. Can't remember the name, huh? A senior moment, perhaps. Oh, oh. <laughs> Enjoy the fun. Another issue with Sadler is his character himself. Feels like a one-note character here in regards to the cult. In the original, he came across as a sound of mind with his plan. A silly plan? Sure, but he had that master manipulator feel about him with his actions. That's lost in the remake, resulting in a downgrade of his character. And speaking of character downgrades, let's come back to Krauser. I wasn't a fan of his character in the remake. They took him in a direction that lost a lot of what made him intriguing about the original. There, he was playing different sides off one another. It was hard to get a read of what his true intentions were. And that voice of his commanded such a presence. Just so we understand each other clearly, I don't trust you. Nor does Wesker. If you try to do anything clever, I will kill you. Here, most of that is stripped away. Instead, he goes overboard about Operation Javier getting him all loopy. I'm glad they tied things in with Darkseid Chronicles, but they went overboard and lost most of what made his character great. Similar to Sadler, he's now more of a one-note character. Revenge. You think I'm doing all this for revenge? Isn't that what this is all about? See, in that jungle... I had a revelation. The most important thing in this world is pure, unadulterated power. Those Illuminados have given me that. His voice here works fine for the more deranged version of him, but I prefer the calm, cool, collected approach in the original. His fight here keeps the major beats with some tweaks here and there, and the fight does a good job of telegraphing what kind of attack to expect, whether it's one to evade or one to parry with a knife. I was ready for his death scene to have Leon walking away telling him to do it himself, but he actually goes through with finishing off Krauser. It's a well done scene. It's just a bummer that Krauser lost a lot of that character that made him noteworthy before. <sighs> One major cut of the island was the removal of the U3 fight. It's speculated that it's going to be featured in the Separate Ways DLC. Replaying the original prior to the remake, I have soured on this fight over the years. The first part in the crates is great, but the fight afterwards is by the numbers and nothing noteworthy. So compared to something like the Statue Salazar chase, I wasn't torn up to see it removed. Here's to hoping that in the Ada DLC, she gets a chance to dodge lasers. Another major cut here. Of all the things that were cut, this surprised me the least. And we're getting near the end stretch here, our good pal Mike shows up for some mayhem. Although with that accent, I was ready for him to call us old sport. Before we have our final encounter with Sadler, we first have to deal with the lost Plagas within Leon and Ashley. This is something that received more emphasis in the remake, how much it's impacting them. It had its moments in the original, like when Leon chokes Ada, but it's more prominent here, and a welcome story improvement. And I could get what they're going for by having a slow gameplay section of us carrying Ashley to the machine, but it did drag on when a cutscene would have been just fine. If I wanted gameplay sections like this, I'd go play a first party Sony exclusive. As the virus is having a much greater impact, the change of having Ashley go first makes sense. Although I'm curious how long it took Ashley to drag an unconscious Leon into the chair to perform the operation. And the final boss with Sadler is well done, although once again, there's an issue where he's telling us his entire life story during the fight, when there's a lot going on. It's hard to focus on. Thank you. 
So much of this could have been fed to the player throughout our time on the island, but that's what they went with, and it's a choice I don't agree with. We got a rocket finale and the final escape. Instead of outright asking Leon to continue the Kennedy and Graham bloodline, she's a bit more coy with her intentions. She obviously wants him around. Thank you for saving me. Don't mention it. You know, I could put in a word with my dad. Have you assigned to my detail, if you're interested? You don't need me. You proved you could handle yourself. Even if you could use a lesson in knife safety. <laughs> Come on. Let's go home. <gasps> of course, for Leon, if it's not Wong, it's wrong. And for Miss Wong, she has a short conversation with Wesker, setting up the events for Resident Evil 5. Another remake in the wakes? All you need to know is a new dawn is breaking. A hundred will give their lives so that just one may live. I am expediting that change. So, we're talking millions of casualties. Billions. But before we get to that, I want to go over something first. When I did my video on the original Resident Evil 4 in the summer of 2021, I made a list of things I wanted their remake to do. I wanted them to keep that campy tone. I did understand they would take a darker tone to fit more of the previous two remakes, but I still wanted that cheese and camp. And they did cut too much of that out here. It's still there, but they dialed back more than I hoped for. Which I found a bit puzzling, because Village and to some degree 7 were able to keep the camp factors present, despite how bleak those games could be at times, especially 7. It was great to see them go crazy with it during the shooting gallery sections, but I was hoping it was going to show up more during the main game. Not a huge detriment by any stretch, but one of note. I hope that they didn't turn Leon or Ashley into a swearing machine like they had with Jill in the remake of 3. I'm glad to see that was the case here. I'm happy that Luis had more of a role in the plot. I mentioned at the time I wanted to see Mendez take more of a pursuer type role in the village. Something I'm glad they didn't go with now. I think I was coming off the fact that Village, who at that point was just a few months old, left me longing for some more pursuers after how short these stretch with Lady Dimitrescu and her daughters were. I wanted the QTEs gone, but to keep the death scenes around. Sadly, that wasn't the case. I also asked them to take their time and not cut too much content. Yes, there were sections that I was bummed to see removed, but it's a night and day difference when compared to the other two remakes, especially the remake of 3. There was much more at stake here with the remake of 4. Allegedly, there was less development and staff working on the remake. However, after seeing the reception of the remake of 3, they threw more time and effort into the remake of 4, and it definitely shows. Very much something to be proud of. It's the best of the RE Engine era titles. Is it better than the original? No, I wasn't expecting it to be. I wasn't expecting lightning to strike twice. But it's a vast improvement of the prior two remakes and stands on its own merits. It turned out about as good as I could imagine. That said, I hope this is it for the series in regards to remakes. But looking at the post credit scenes with Wesker, it looks like that won't be the case. Now, Resident Evil has an interesting history in regards to remakes. The original plan for the first Resident Evil was to be a remake of the NES title Sweet Home. Eventually became a spiritual successor. Six years later, the first game received a remake. The advancement in technology from 1996 to 2002 allowed them to better capture that original vision they had without technological constraints. 2019 would see the next remake, with Resident Evil 2. 21 years between the original and its remake, a notable shift going from fixed camera to over the shoulder. While it had its issues, it was able to carry over and create a new experience that stood on its own. The first stretch in the police department is one of my favorite stretches in any of the Resident Evil games. It's too bad that they cut the remake of 3 to shreds of what was there prior. It had its moments, but fell well short of the original. And then we get to 4, a game where much of its DNA is still prominent in the gaming landscape nearly 20 years later. It was far less of an over Hall compared to the remakes of 2 and 3, but there was much more riding on it in regards to anticipation. And they delivered. But where do we go from here? I'm really hoping they've gotten all these remakes out of their systems so they can focus on moving the series forward or free up teams to work on other projects. Resident Evil 9 will be coming, but what about spin-offs? Whatever happened to the long-rumored Revelations 3? There's plenty of mileage left there and room for old characters to return. Or how about a spin-off where Ashley returns? She did talk about wanting to become an agent like Leon. I wonder what she's up to now in the timeline. You know, I... I was thinking... We work well together, don't we? I guess so. Right? Maybe someday I'll become an agent like you. What do you think? We could protect the US from any and all threats. Now, I do have some curiosity around Resident Evil 5 as a remake, a game that was controversial back in the mid to late 2000s due to the setting of Africa. Today, you can't sneeze without offending someone. Could you imagine how much guff Capcom would have to deal with in this day and age? I'm sure the sales would be fine. 
Boycotts never really do anything, but the sheer headaches it would cause would drive the coolest of cucumbers up the wall. There was something one of the actors of Resident Evil 5 that stuck with me to this day in regards to the controversy. It's in Africa. It's been in Antarctica. It's been, I think, in Spain. It's been in the Midwest. It wasn't racist then. Why should it be racist now? It's in Africa. Have fun with the game. It's only a game. Why do you have to be mad? And if they go with a remake of 5, then what? A remake of Code Veronica? I've seen people clamor for this one. There was a fan remake in the works, but it received a cease and desist treatment. Something they rarely do for fan works. Now, this could be a sign that they're doing a remake themselves. Although, from what I understand, the developers were trying to profit off development along with pulling assets straight from the RE engine. I'd love to see Claire again, but perhaps in something new? Or what about remaking the remake? Why not remake the original Resident Evil with the over-the-shoulder perspective? And on that note, I might get on the remake action. I might remake a video on the Resident Evil remake. My initial video was from my earlier days of the channel and what I'm not 100% happy with. But anyways, when is enough enough? The remakes have been selling well, but it's not like new entries haven't been selling. It's not like the series was in hibernation like Dead Space was. It's time to move on the series, do more spin-offs, free up teams to work on other projects or come up with new IPs. This is less of a Resident Evil problem than one that's been rearing its ugly head in the industry over the last few years. Now, I'm not 100% opposed to remakes, but they're getting out of hand. A lot of these games hold up just fine, from a time frame when they were made by smaller teams where there was more love and care put into them. I'm not saying that love and care isn't put into these remakes. They put their work in for this remake, but game development has seen team sizes and budgets explode. Risks are cut down on and wider markets need to be reached to recoup investments. And at some point, you're going to hit diminishing returns with constant remakes. I feel that's the case for Resident Evil. As far as remakes go, Resident Evil 4 is a happy note to end on. They did about as good of a job as they could in this day and age. It doesn't reach the highs of the original, but I never expected it to. But it's another excellent entry in a long-running series that shows no signs of slowing down. I just hope now they can move past remakes and focus on the future. Thanks for watching. You got it? Duh. I need you to open it from the other side. Pretty much a master of unlocking.